So today's stream is going to be me attempting to combine the methods that go into a Let's Play, which if you aren't familiar with those, um, if you have children, you've probably seen them watching them on Twitch or on YouTube or such. You've probably seen references to them in the media. It's typically where YouTubers or Twitch streamers go on their computers or consoles and they play a game. Uh, it could be new games, it could be old games, they could put uh, modifications inside the game. Uh, it's typically the way that speedruns are shown. If you are unfamiliar with Revit, then you are definitely in for a treat because uh, it is a it is not a video game. If you are if you played Revit, you played with Revit, you might kind of disagree with me that sometimes if you're able to get into it recreationally, it can be like a game. But um. Sorry. So today we're going to be attempting to mix Revit with a Let's Play style. Uh, essentially, I haven't established a lot of the rules yet because I am going to be creating the rules of this Let's Play as, as the time goes on, as we do this over the course of... Uh, weeks. I'm not sure if I'm going to do this every week, bi-weekly. Um, it's going to just kind of evolve based on the needs of the audience and the needs of myself. So one thing that I do know about this is we're going. I'm going to get into Revit essentially. And because especially since I am a I don't have a ton of followers. I usually don't typically have active followers. The way that I'm going to be doing things is by just kind of getting into Revit. So I'm going to be using Autodesk Revit um, LT 2023, which means if you've used standard Revit 2022 or Revit 2023 recently, you're going to notice that a few of the different uh, tabs that will be up at the top are going to be missing. And that's because I pay for the light version. I call it LT Light. I don't know if that's necessarily what LT stands for, but I call it Revit Light. And it just it has all the things that I need. Um, one major disadvantage is it doesn't have the plugins. So if you're used to using Revit plugins or the massing in place tools, you're probably not going to see that much on these, and I don't expect to be buying the full version of Revit anytime soon. So if you are wanting to see what types of things that Revit can do with plugins, or what types of things you can do with modeling in place, or a couple of the other features that are only available in the full version, full release of Revit, regardless of the year, uh, you will need to tune, it, tune into a, a, another streamer. And I have some recommendations if anyone has a uh, need for that. So I'm just going to go ahead and kind of get started. I've started the residential template. And again, the way this is going to go is I'm just going to kind of just build nonsense. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to have a final design in mind of what I'm doing. And I will I will try to make it be a realistic building. I'm not going to just have it be just unclosed shapes and and unsupported units because I do want the users that are looking at this to be able to replicate the techniques and the tools that I'm using in here in their own daily processes but I am not going to be making anything specific as of right now um, maybe in a year or two we could come in here and build the Hagia Sophia or something in here I could take requests for certain rooms that people are wanting to do in their project and we could kind of mock up based off of suggestions that way but as of today i'm just going to kind of go ahead and get started just so you could see how i work in the software um i will be having a couple 
I might have a couple hiccups along the way of methods that I'm going to implement because I am not going to, as of right now, use my template that I use for my business. And I will never use the templates for the companies that I work for. So if I am missing things that I might not be able to get in the local Imperial library or uh, be able to quickly download from like Revit City or a similar website like that, uh, then I'm just not gonna go over that item. So again, without further ado, let's just go ahead and get started. The first thing I do when I am opening up a project, once I've picked the template that I want, is I'm gonna wanna go into the file, save as options, and then I'm gonna wanna save this so that I can begin making the file because you don't wanna save over the template that you have in the original file. And especially if you open this up based off your template, you don't wanna save it over the same name as well. And if you start a template from Revit, it's always gonna call itself project one. And if you've ever been the type of person that is not very good at naming their layers, not very good at setting up uh, their uh, file names just in general, maybe you splash your stuff on your desktop, maybe your uh, downloads folder in your computer has a bunch of files called download one, two, three, four, five and such. You might be able to get by with some files, maybe even the way that you save your images for screenshots with not having a proper naming system. But I'm gonna say that one of the things that has really helped my level of organization as a drafter is coming up with a proper naming system. Uh, personally, I, I work with a few different designers and a few different companies. So although there is times where I am working by myself and I might want to name my file something like 2Z and then followed by the date. So today is going to be 10 one 22 and then followed by the project name. So I'm just going to call it Let's play one. And so if I am doing work directly with a client, I might call it 2Z after my own business. But if I'm doing work with a, another designer to say design studio one, I might name it like this and then properly make sure to put it in a folder organization that follows that as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and save it into here. As I develop this Let's Play, I might have a better browser organization. But again, I don't want to go through my computer too much and possibly risk showing off any other things with other clients for, for confidentiality purposes. So I'm just going to be saving this simply in my documents area. But I do recommend trying to find uh, a, a browser organization method that works best for you and that you can replicate. So I'm going to go ahead and save this now. I guess I'm going to be doing this for my fictitious design studio one name that I just came up with. Okay, so first step. Again, if you're taking notes, number one first step after opening the template is you're going to want to save your file. I also recommend if you see in my file name, there's a date system. And the reason I do that is because every day that I open up a client's project, I am going to save it with a new date. So if I was to work on this tomorrow, it, this file would be called DS1 underscore 10.02.22. And then uh, if, because that's the, pro the project name is Let's Play 1, that's where I'm going to go with that. Then the second step I'm going to do, this can typically, it, it, the way that you look at this can be different with a commercial versus a residential project. But typically the first step that I'm gonna do, especially if I have any information about the building, even just how the building is built, is I'm gonna wanna get into one of these exterior elevations because we're gonna wanna set our datum levels. So I double clicked, I get into autopilot here. If I ever go move too fast and I click buttons that you didn't see, let me know. Because again, I love this program, so I just kind of get into autopilot. Um, I'm going to activate one of these exterior elevations on the outside here, which you can also activate inside of your project browser. 
Uh, by default, it's going to be in the bottom left um, under your properties browser. If you go to your project browser and you go under elevations, a building elevation, which is synonymous with exterior elevations, you can essentially open up any of these, which uh, I'd probably start listing these out uh, as I'm doing this, but Revit major mistake number one, I believe, yes, under the elevations, building elevations east, for some reason, as far as I can remember, the few automated bottom elevation points that are placed are always hidden in view. If you go to any of the other exterior elevations, you're going to notice by default in the residential template, it's going to open with a roof, a second floor, a first floor at foundation level. And then at the very bottom, there's a basement, the top of footing, TO being top of, BO being bottom of footing. These three you can see in the north, in the south, and in the west elevations. But again, for some reason, as long as I can remember the east elevation, this will hang up a lot of people because it doesn't have those available. So in my residential template that I've created, one of the very first things that I did is unhid those so that in the future, all of these exterior elevations will have that. So in order to do that, I'm going to go down here to the reveal hidden elements. I'm going to click the light bulb and you're going to see all of the items that are hidden from this particular view are going to pop up as magenta. So I'm going to select those items and I'm going to do an unhide element. And I did a drag box to select those, which in the future I'll probably go over the differences and the directions for drag boxes. And I'm going to unhide those elements. And then I'm going to either click on the light bulb in the bottom to turn that back off. And then I'm going to do the toggle reveal hidden elements. Or, or the reveal hidden elements so that I can get out of those. One of those would, either of those would work. The advantage I think for up here is because usually you select stuff, you unhide it, and then that button's right next to it. But it's also more intuitive for people to know that they clicked on the light bulb in the bottom to get in here. So we'll click on the light bulb to get out. But they both are the same method. So going back to my original point. You get into either any of these exterior elevations. I'm just going to hang out in the east since we just got done fixing it, so we might as well use it. I'm going to look at this and I'm going to decide, do these accurately represent what I'm going to build? And I don't even necessarily mean the heights, especially as a student. You look at these elevations and your teachers will often say, all right, make sure you are properly setting your second floor heights or make sure you are properly setting your basement heights who who is supposed to teach us to just know that? Because I miss that part. Um, when I go to on the job site now, uh, it's usually pretty hard to tell necessarily where the second floor is going to be. Um, you can have a ceiling height of nine foot in your first floor. You can have a ceiling height of eight feet in your first floor. You can know that your second floor flooring system is a 10 inch flooring system but really, you're still kind of making guesses for the most part. So unless you have given plans or have done some moderate uh, measurements, especially if you have a good open stairwell, um, you're probably not going to know necessarily where the second floor is. When I say try to get your elevations to be as accurate as you can, I am not looking at these numbers at all. I am talking about the existence of these elevations. So your building probably has a first floor. If it doesn't, I would love to hear how it doesn't. Um, your building probably has a foundation. I mean, there's different types of construction, but one way or another, you're going to have a foundation level. And just so you know, in Revit, foundation level is your top of your foundation, not your bottom of your foundation. And then you're going to have to look at these others to decide. So fundamental ones your building is probably going to have is going to be your first floor, your foundation, and your roof. Your building, of course, is going to have a top and bottom of footing. But 
in school and even in a lot of situations in real life, I don't always find myself having to put those in, especially when I work with designers, because they're more just needing to know what the levels of things are. The basement level is going to hold some finishes on it. The uh, first floor is going to have some levels, is going to have some items on it. The second floor can have items on it. And then there's going to be elements on the second floor in terms of design that are going to want to refer to the roof level. but Unless you're working with architects, which I do, and they ask um, these types of items, you're probably not going to have those either. So the real things you're asking yourself at the beginning here is, do I have a second floor? And do I have a basement? If you don't have one of these, which, so for the purpose of this, I'm just going to say... Actually, no, I want to leave this building as complex as possible. But just for example, I could say, oh, I don't have a second floor. So you can click on this level and literally delete it. If you press delete, you're going to get an angry pop-up with a bunch of different stuff. And all this is telling you is all the stuff over here in your project browser that relates to the second level, like your second floor ceiling plan and your second floor framing plan and electrical plan and such, they're going to be deleted. Well, if your project doesn't have a second floor, then these things don't matter. So this is not this is a warning, but this isn't necessarily an error. This is just letting you know, hey, the consequences of you deleting this little dotted line in the elevation level is going to have much more consequences than you just cleaning that up. Are you probably wanting to just hide it or something like go into the go into the temporary hide and hide it from the view or are you wanting to view hide it from the view or something like that? Um, just so you know, deleting it is going to delete all these things. Well, if, again, if you're going back to your original concept and you're thinking, well, I don't have a second floor, then this is not a consequence. This is actually going to clean up a lot of this stuff. And so if you look, I'm going to hide some of these items and you're going to see over here, all this cleanup I would have to do of stuff that wouldn't even exist in my project. I could delete my second floor. And you're going to see over here, it's going to delete all those things away as well. So all I'm going to be left with is things that are relevant to the project that I'm in. But I'm going to undo that because I don't know how long this project is going to go. And I don't know what types of stuff we're going to want to mock up in here. So I'm going to leave in the option for all of these things. So I am implying here... I like to kind of throw these in too because yes, I could do simple math. I could do simple addition and subtraction. But when I have 30 other things going on in my mind, it's nice to have them kind of do the math for me. So in one of these elevations, I'll typically go in to the dimension tool, which I use the, uh, the, uh, it's not linear dimension. It's the align dimension tool, which is by default in the quick access toolbar up here at the top. Or you could just go to annotate and go to aligned dimension. And then I clicked on all these lines and then clicked in the blank space for my last click because that's how you end the dimension tool. That is not intuitive with uh, Revit. After a while, it becomes intuitive. But when learning Revit, it is not intuitive to know to have your last click be in blank space. So now I have done the dimensioning and I could see that I'm implying that my first floor is... Uh, a nine foot, nine foot to the second floor, not necessarily ceiling height, because these levels are to the top of the floor system. So I'm I'm more implying an eight foot ceiling height with this, and we'll see that that'll make a lot more sense when we start getting some actual mass into this. Okay, so I have decided that I like the floors and levels that they've got going on for us. I don't know if these numbers are correct. But that's the good thing about Revit, which, fun fact, Revit's, Revit was named after the, uh, the fact that it is called, it's called Revit because Revit is short for Revise Instantly. And the reason why it has that nickname or name is because whenever you place most things in Revit, you can select that item later and then very easily change it. So when you're placing, if you want a roof level, or if I was to even have a third floor in here, 
I wouldn't have to have the pressure of knowing that I placed it correctly at the beginning. I don't have to have that pressure of thinking, oh my gosh, I just copied this up and made my third floor be four foot above the second floor. That's a catastrophe. There's always a way in Revit to either click on the item and change its properties that are inherently built into it, or select items and refer to temporary or standard dimensions and tell the items to adjust themselves later. So that's that's a lot of pressure you could take yourself off in Revit is knowing that as you're drawing, everything that you're doing can be very, very easily changed. And one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to create this type of video where you can see me draw is you're gonna notice that when I conceptualize or even lay out existing conditions of an interior floor plan, I almost always draw the walls incorrect quickly and then measure them all up with dimensions and then adjust them afterwards. I just find it a lot easier to get walls and such on paper. This is very counterintuitive for those of you who are hand drafters, but you just got to get all of the walls and all the information onto the paper and then reference them against each other and then adjust them. That's again my style. That may not be your style. Um, if you want to do it more exactly, I'll eventually cover how to draft using location lines properly, but that's not how I'm going to cover it today because that's not my favorite way to draft. So I've set my levels. I'm happy with my levels. So I'm going to go back to my first floor. And then again, this is another time when students will ask, what should I start with? Should I start with my floor? Should I start with my walls? Should I start with any other types of layout items? There's a lot of flexibility in Revit in terms of how you want to start a project, but there are things that are also going to depend on other things in Revit. So for example, you could technically, I've never done it, but you could technically draw your floors first and then draw your walls on top of that, which might sound like a normal thing if you've worked in actual construction because that's how building works. But if you've done hand drafting or if you've done any type of computer drafting, particularly computer drafting because you don't have to worry about hosting so much with hand drafting, you'll see that you typically want to have something for floors and boundary-based tools to reference. So what I mean by that is I'm going to just start with walls because that's typically the first place that I'm going to start unless I am entering uh, client information, which I will go over in future videos. But I'm wanting to keep this one simple, just keep this uh, keep this easy to jump into and play around with if you are needing a refresher. So the first thing I start with is walls. So if I start just the top wall tool, I'm not going to do the drop down. I'm not working in any of these weird structural walls, in place walls, and we're not going to even go over sweeps and reveals until later. So I'm just going to start the standard wall tool and I'm going to go into the type selector. And because I'm going to be more blunt in these videos than I have typically been in a classroom environment. I'm just going to say I hate these generic walls. I hate all the generic items in Revit. I don't like the generic floors. I don't like the generic walls. I don't like the generic roofs. I don't like the generic ceilings. I don't even like the furniture when it looks too generic. Because the problem with these is you have decided to invest either money or, well, actually, if you're signed up for the class, you paid money too. So if you are using Revit, somehow you have thrown money at Autodesk because you said, I need a building information modeler. And then when you opened up the building information modeler, you went and chose one of the few things in the program that doesn't really carry information. I get why people have used these. They're really good for massing because, because they 
don't carry in any information, you don't have to necessarily worry about the different layers having to meet up with other layers in other ways. But then you're going to run into that problem where one day you're going to have to select all those items and you're going to have to change them back. And you're going to hope when you change them back that you had them face in the right direction because you're going to have to rely on simpler tools like which way the arrow is facing to know which way is the exterior side because no matter how much detail you bring into your project, you're never going to know which way the generic model is facing. So one day you're going to have to change that, hoping that you have it facing the right way. And you're also going to hope that when you drew this, you drew it with the proper location line location and that you're not having to have, you're not changing this to a new wall type where you're suddenly losing four and three quarters inches inside of all of your spaces. So unless for some reason, which if you do, that's okay, I'm not going to be upset. If for some reason you bought Revit so that you can use it for conceptual massing, like a very, very, very overpowered SketchUp, then you know what? Fine. Generic walls, generic roofs, you could really get some really cool massing. And you'd be able to use a lot of the same uh, mental capacity that you would use for SketchUp. So let's just, let me show you what I mean by that. Get some generic stuff in. Yeah, you could say my walls are going to be 24 feet uh, based on exterior location. And on top of that is going to be a generic roof that is going to have a overhang of one foot and a slope of... Let's go ahead and just place these and a slope of 512 with a gable. I guess technically you could use the software like this. <laughs> and let's go ahead and put the roof on the roof. That's why we just spent that whole first step of establishing our levels. You could use the software for this type of conceptual massing, I guess. But you know what? Everything that I just did right there, I could have done those that that all those same exact steps with an actual wall. And then if even by the off chance that you didn't think your project was needing to go further than this, which I've never worked on a project on Revit that only required massing and then the client threw money at me and said, cool, thanks. That's all I needed. Um, I, I've needed to go further than this. I've needed to at least provide renderings and some three-dimensional views, even if I'm not necessarily providing the construction documents. So I just, I have a problem. I have a lot of problems with a lot of stuff in Revit. You're going to hear all about those, hopefully not all in one day. Um, but I have a real problem with using these generic items because you could have just as easily just had all of these items be an actual thing just as quickly and you'd know which way is facing exterior and it's going to render better so i'm going to pick some actual materials but i'm going to go back because i was playing with generic materials and generic families and i don't want to do that because I want to start by talking about the importance of location lines. I've always wanted to elaborate more on these, so this is the perfect opportunity to do so. So what do I mean by location lines? So I'm going to go into the wall tool, and as you may have expected by now, I'm not going to pick a generic wall. I'm going to pick one of these exterior walls that are built into Revit out of the box. So if you buy Revit 2023, you're going to get all these families, and these families are going to be the residential-based families because these are the residential systems families that come default with the residential template because we started the residential template. If we started one of the other templates, the default systems families, like the walls, would be more commercially driven. So you can know with confidence that if you start the residential template, 
that you're going to have some residential items. So I'm just going to pick one of these residential items. Um, just from playing around at the beginning, I saw that the brick on wood stud showed a good rendering on the outside. And I have a feeling down the road uh, providing a, a material in Revit on our exterior walls is going to help us later on if we decide to play with aligning the poche or hatch on the materials. So I'm going to start the exterior brick on wood stud. And we are going to act like this building exists already. OK, so the client sent me to a job site. The client sent me a PDF. The client handed me a bound 24 by 36 roll of documents from the builder in the 80s. Or maybe I was sent to the city to pick up some documents there. One way or another, I was given some numbers. Maybe it was literally on a napkin. But this building exists right now in uh, City X in Colorado, wherever that may be. So it exists, and we're needing to remodel it. So that is already enough information for me to know how I'm going to go and approach these location lines. If a building already exists, that means that you know the measurements for the inside of the building. So I'm going to act like this building right now for this moment does not have any interior walls, which, oh man, that would be a dream to site measure. I guess if you do warehouses, it's not much different. And I'm going to turn the detail level up so that we can actually see. So this building exists. So when this person went in and site measured it, when they put down their tape measure or they put up their laser, they put their laser up against this wall and their laser shot to the other side of the wall. And when their laser did that thing, it told us that the building is gross. I'm not working with fractions. I'll even work with inches. I'll do 53 six. They shot their laser from this point to this point. They didn't shoot it from the frame. I mean, very likely, un not unless it was unfinished or for some reason there happened to be a hole in the wall over here, perfectly across from where there would be another hole in the wall over here. Again, not something that happens in real life. I haven't really had to work with that. Typically, if I'm working with existing conditions, I'm shooting from drywall or gypsum or something like that to the other side and hitting other drywall or gypsum. Again, try not to get uh, art pieces, the frames of art pieces and such clothing inside of a closet or something like that, trying to really hit drywall to drywall or whatever the construction at the time is. So what that means is we've gone from the interior finish of the wall to the interior finish of the other wall. Okay? So I'm going to start that wall again because this is our building existing. And over here, make sure the crop is off, otherwise it's not going to let me. Over here, I'm going to mimic as if I am drawing this building that exists. So I guess technically I should throw you over here because this is the default drawing space, which is centered in all the default views. So if you can start drawing in here, you're going to save yourself a few minutes. Yeah, I think minutes is fair. And let's get another direction. My dimension string is trying to go to the center of the wall because up here in the options, dimension strings are set to automatically try to look for wall center line. You can tab to get to other items inside of Revit by just clicking tab. But to give it a fighting chance, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to tell it that I actually want to prefer to go to wall faces because the face of this wall in this case will be gypsum. So I don't have to typically tab as much for, to do that. So I'm going to go from that wall to this wall. And we're going to, oh, I can already tell that's trying to be a fraction. I'm not even going to listen to that. And we're going to change this to 42.6. No, 42.8. Let's get different numbers. So we have 53.6. 
428. This building actually exists. I was given drawings. Maybe in the drawings they did tell me from frame to frame, and that I'll go over next. But I am acting as if we've done a site measure, or somebody has done a site measure for me and have sent me these actual sketches. So I'm going to start that wall again. I'm going to go into, I'm going to use a little trick. I'm going to click on one of the walls. I'm going to click on create similar, and that will just start that same wall tool. Um, or you could just go into the architecture tab wall tool. And so this is where location line comes in. This is the big thing I'm talking about today. Um, when you start the wall tool, you will see that the location line is available in the options bar and the properties palette. It's always going to be available in the properties palette because that's just going to be how it defines this wall. Whatever's in here defines this wall at all times, even after it's created. But you'll only see it up here in the options bar up here when you're drawing it because these are all tools to help you draw the wall. This up here, the draw panel, as well as down here. These are all part of the draw tool. So. I am going to go into location line and you're going to see that there's six options every time you're drawing a wall. There's the center of the wall and the center of the core, which I rarely ever use. If you consider either looking at existing plans and trying to draw your plans off of that, if you consider going to a site measure and seeing what your lasers or your uh, tape measure are telling you. Or the third option, which we'll go over later, is uh, new construction, which means that you can essentially put the wall location or studs or finish wherever you want. In any of those scenarios, which are the typical scenarios that you're going to use when doing BIM drafting like this, I have not used wall center line or core center line. Um, I've had discussions with people of whether or not it is better to measure to the center of walls and doors or to the openings. And there is no winning argument with that because everyone needs to typically do them differently. But in terms of the wall or core center line, particularly wall center line, that's chaotic. That is considering that it's just going to go in the middle of the wall having no regard for the finishes or actual construction. Core center line, that, that may be. I've, I've heard of people liking to know where the center line of a stud is. Um, I've seen people, framers, uh, show locations for center lines of studs. However, I've still never done that when I draw the wall because... Even if people on site like to know where the center lines of studs are because it's just easier that way to actually frame it physically. Um, even on the plans, I typically see the walls going to the studs um, either on either side of the stud. If the stud's going up and down on the paper, it could go on the left or right. And if the stud's going left or right, I've seen it on the top or bottom. I've still really never seen anything be based on center lines. So I'm just going to say blanket statement over pretty much any of my streams that I'm ever going to do. I'm probably never going to use these top two. That brings us to these. So finish face, I told you when we first started this project, and I said that the only thing that I brainstormed was that I am going to be doing a project that exists and I said that was already enough information for me to know which location I want to which location line I want to use that made me think I'm going to be using finish face because finish face is going to be this finish face of the wall and if somebody shoots a laser from the inside of a wall to the inside of another wall, and that laser measurement gave us that 53.6, then I know what the finish face interior distance is. So if I put on finish face interior, and I go up, and then I go over 53.6, and then down, 
I'm going to know that I was drawing with the location line there. And for visual representation, I want to also show finish face interior. Again, when you're drawing a wall, you're basically just drawing a line, which a line has no depth. Uh, I believe that's the definition. It has, no, it has no thickness to it. It is a gaugeless material. A line just has two points. But you're using a line to create something that has depth. So when you're saying, like if you just draw a line, and I say that this line goes from this point to this point, we don't have to critically think this. The line started here, and then the line ended here. That's the line. Unless you have some type of offset or something set up, when you're drawing the line, offset like this, you know, maybe that's critically thinking, oh, it's two feet above where it's going. But even then, it's just an offset, it's just a line. But when you have a wall tool going and you're drawing a line, you have to ask yourself, what part of that wall am I drawing? Am, am I saying that that line is the front of the wall? Or in this case, the interior finish, which you could see the interior finish, finish face interior, just like our location line says is following our cursor. And that's because that's the part of the wall that we're drawing. If I change this to uh, core face interior, this is more acting like the building has been, we're, we're proposing a new construction because core face, if you ever see core in Revit, that's pretty much your stud. You can almost synonymously uh, connect those two. If you ever see the word core in here, or when you're dimensioning, or something like that, or when something's extending into a core, which we'll go over in the future, core is stud. Whether it's residential wood studs or metal studs, or whether it's commercial wood or metal studs. So if we do core face interior, and we start drawing, you're going to see that the mouse is going to go based on the core interior of the location line versus core exterior. And you can also kind of tell where it is because the magenta line, I think that magenta arrow will typically try and also follow where the actual location is. Or maybe it's just middle, maybe it's just showing the middle of the line. Okay, so the reason I bring this up and the reason why I say this is important is because one of the most common problems I see in Revit is students and professionals will start the wall tool. And like I said, by default, no matter what template you go into, the wall tool is set default to wall center line. So I'll tell a student to draw a 20 foot by 30 foot interior building. So, or the book will say it. And so they'll go they'll click they'll go up 20 foot they'll go over 30 foot they'll go down 20 foot they'll go over 30 foot so because i went up 20 over 30 down 20 and over 30 that means that this is 20 by 30 either interior or exterior I'm, we might have done it wrong but one way or another they should be right well, interior is now 29 and 7 eighths, not 30. So maybe it was exterior. So we look at the exterior and we see the exterior is 30 foot 11 and 1 eighth. So what was 30? Well, when the person started the wall tool, they didn't care about their location line. So it was just doing the center line, which again, as I said earlier, is completely useless. We can find a scenario where the core center line is a good location line. I will still fight on it, but there is a reason for it. There is no reason for wall center line. This should not only not exist, but it should definitely not be the default set for location line. I feel like this is one of those Autodesk trying to wean out the people who just wouldn't know that. 
Um, and the reason I say that is because I was one of them. Uh, when I first started Revit, uh, my awesome instructor told me that the location line is very important. And I played with it a couple times. It didn't make sense to me. So I blew it off. And when I say blow it off, I mean I didn't use it the rest of that class. I didn't use it the rest of that time in school. And when I went to a couple of professional places, I still was not using it, which isn't the worst because again, like I say, I like to draw things by just getting into, just drawing it, slapping a dimension on it, clicking on a wall and adjusting it. And it's 30 foot. I don't know why it's 30 foot. I don't know what the location line was set. Doesn't matter. Throw a dimension, get your dimension set by selecting an item and changing it and you're done. However, even considering this technique, I still now save time because the last uh, probably six years now, I have been caring about the location line. And you can consider the amount of time I save when I properly set my elevations. Like I was saying, I go into at the beginning, make sure my elevations, my second floor and all that is set, properly setting these things to them and then making sure that my location line is set to where I actually need to draw. So like I said, this building is a 53 foot six inch wide by 42 foot eight inch. So I want to show for those that like precision, um, which I guess I'll just call this Xan mode. I'm going to want to draw it just accurately so that I don't have to deal with the garbage later as much. So I'm gonna start this wall tool. I'm gonna to do finish face interior because we know what our interior dimensions are of this building. Let me delete these away so we aren't confusing ourselves with what I'm referencing. We've just got this building that we mocked up. I was told 53.6 to interior to interior, 42.8 interior to interior. I don't know what the wall construction is, the finish could change. The finish could be demolished and removed. The studs can be updated in size. But we know that for the most part, unless we're wanting to change the footprint of the building, that this is the existing interior footprint of the building. So I'm going to start a wall tool. Doesn't really matter which wall it's going to be unless the client is very sure about what type they're going to be going with. Then I'm probably going to pick one of these because, again, Easiest thing to do in almost all forms of Revit is to find something that's close to what you're working with and then modify it from there. So I've started, I'm just going to start this brick on wood stud. And because I know the interior dimensions, I'm going to go up to finish face interior because I know it's an interior dimension that I'm being given and it's the finish face that I'm going to be drawing to. So two easy ways to do this without doing it even my way is you can do four lines or you can do a rectangle. Actually doing the rectangle is going to be a pain this way because I put in inches. Um, I'll, show, I'll show that anyway though. So I'm going to start with just lines. So 43 or 53 foot 6, 42 foot 8, 40, or 53 6, 42.8. So I'm going to click up here. I'm going to go over and I'm going to do a numerical move, which is where you pull your mouse in the direction that you want something to either move or draw to. And then you just type in what you want. So I'm going to really I'm punish myself keeping these inches in. I keep forgetting what it is. 53.6. So going to the right. And then I'm going to type in 53 space 6 because Revit assumes feet. But then if you put in a space, it'll assume the X value is inches. And I'm going to press enter. And then I go down 42.8. And then I can go over the 53.6. I could type it in, but since I'm going back perpendicularly, or actually parallel technically, but ending at the same location, um, you're going to see that this blue dotted line is going to come up, which those are called aligning lines. And also, if you look below the wall, you'll see a temporary dimension in blue telling me that it is indeed set to 53 foot six. So I'm going to go ahead and click there. 
and then for several reasons, the aligning line, the dimension, and the fact that it's literally snapping to its original location with magenta colors, which are not a Revit thing. They are an auto, all Autodesk have similar snap symbols. So if you're coming from AutoCAD or any other Autodesk software, um, you already have a uh, heads, you're already ahead on knowing your snap icons. But I'm just going to click anywhere. This is actually an important thing about Revit that I like to kind of brag about it. If you click anywhere on two items meeting, as long as Revit can calculate the way that they're going to meet, which it almost always can, uh, it's always going to meet cleanly. So if I end the wall here, it's going to end it cleanly. If I had ended the wall past it, like this, it would still, whoop, whoa, it was acting like it wasn't gonna, it's gonna still meet up cleanly. There's of course times where Revit is going to fight you on that, but as long as two things are meeting perpendicularly, like we're going to be messing with today, you should be good. So that is drawing using the location lines because I've only drawn these four walls. I can confidently just select these items and kind of drag them more into the center of our default drawing space, which again, you don't have to be very driven on making sure it's in the center of. It's just, it's just helpful because then your building will be in front of your elevations, not being cut by them like a section and you won't have to make as many adjustments later, but that's also avoidable if your building is too big for the original drawing space anyway. So we've got this drawn. That is drawing using the location line. Uh, the second way I wanted to show is, use, is doing the same thing, but with a rectangle, which the more I thought about it, the more I realized the rectangle really goes more with my technique because you're kind of drawing an arbitrary shape. And then from there, you're going in and using temporary or <clears throat> permanent dimensions to adjust those. Water check. So if I go into the rectangle, I'm going to start in the same top corner. But when I go down, it's going to give me numbers in both directions because I'm drawing a rectangle. So where I was saying this is going to be difficult, um, probably maybe not impossible, but difficult is making sure that I can move this in a way where I'm going to get the inches and C to verify that I can. So let's see if we can. Um, again, this the rectangle might, might work better for smaller rooms, like if you're doing a room, interior room layout within your building. Uh, it might be easier to see like, ah, oh, 10 by 10, perfect. That's a good quick graphic draw. But that's not what we're doing in this case. In this case, we're wanting to try and use the rectangle tool to get this building. So 53, 6, 42, 8. So I'm gonna do this and we have to zoom in enough where it's going to start giving us the six inches. 53, 6. 42, 8. Oh no, I'm not going to get the 8. Because so for Revit, when you're zoomed to a certain distance, it's going to snap to basically feet marks. And this, it's actually jumping four foot increments when I move this. As I zoom in, it lets me move in six inch increments. But if I move in enough to where it's going to show me inch increments, I'm not going to be able to see my dimension. So I'm actually going to say that unless you're doing a smaller building, um, it wouldn't be very easy to use the rectangle for this. But the rectangle tool does work for the way that I draw this. So those are by the book ways to get the location line working for you. But I'm going to do it the way that I do it. So I'm just going to start the wall tool. I'm going to go to the rectangle tool and I'm not going to look at the measurements. I'm just going to draw it about the same size. I do not care what size that was. I really don't. Now I'm going to dimension it because you're probably going to have to add dimensions eventually in your project anyway. So you might as well start doing it right now. Gross fractions and interior to interior. And then the thing that makes Revit Revit, I'm just going to modify the walls using the dimensions. So 
Again, left to right width interior is 53.6. So, in order to make this gross number turn into 53.6, we're going to have to move one of these outer walls. So, one thing that you might have forgotten in the process of Revit is in most programs, you can select the dimension tool and then change the dimension tool to represent what you want. Um, I think even AutoCAD kind of has that type of vocabulary where if you want a line to be a different length, you click on the line and, and you s change the dimension to be the actual item. In Revit, you'll notice uh, if, you're, if you haven't used it in a while, you'll probably notice that you keep getting this pop up. And this is because this is telling you what you <clears throat> want the dimension text to do, not what you want it to say. And of course, you'll see replace with text and you might say, why don't I just replace this and just have it say what it's supposed to be. And Revit will yell at you and say you cannot lie and just tell the dimension to say a value. So. The way things work in Revit, which again, this is not intuitive early on, it gets more intuitive, I promise, the more you use Revit, is you'll set your dimension after drawing your walls, and then you have to basically choose which of these walls are going to move to make that happen. Because right now, the width of this interior space is 60 foot, 67 foot and 7 eighths of an inch. But we want this interior width to be 53 foot 6. So it doesn't matter which of these walls you select more than likely, especially early on in the project. It really doesn't matter which one of them you select. You just need to pick one of them. And then you're going to see your dimension or your temporary dimension if it's going to the place which you want, which by default they won't, which is why I added a, a dimension. I'll go over how to uh, change temporary dimension settings later. But if I go into, if I select one of the walls and I go into the dimension string that I placed, which is going from interior to interior, you're going to see that it's blue. Blue means it can be modified. So with one of the proper walls selected, I'm going to click on that dimension and I'm going to tell it what I want it to be. In this case, it's supposed to be 53 foot 6 inches. Since I have this wall selected, when I press enter, this wall is going to do whatever it has to do, move out or in, to make that original number turn into this number accurate, <clears throat> which in this case, it needed to be moved to the right about 10 feet, which is why we saw the wall move 10 feet to the right. Now we're going to do the same with the other one, the bottom or top wall. So. Right now it's 47 foot and 7 eighths inches. So I'm just going to select one of those and I'm going to select that value. And it's supposed to be 42 foot 8. So I'm going to type in 42 8. And because I had the top wall selected, it moved the top wall down to make it go from the original dimension to this new dimension. So that seemed tedious, but that is pretty much how I'm going to do things. So I'll just show you again. I'm probably, since I'm recording, I'm probably going to mess it up, but I'm going to try and kind of show you in real time what that actually would look like. Um, so I just did my measurements or someone called it out to me. I'm going to start my wall tool. I'm going to pick the correct wall. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to say this goes to roof. Location line, okay, someone told me that it was to the finish on the interior because I'm doing interior dimensions. Oh, we didn't use the tape on the outside of the house. We used uh, lasers on the inside. And, um, okay, this looks good. So I was given the dimension, but I don't care what it is. I know it's a square house, so I'm going to draw a shape. And then I'm going to start the dimension tool. I'm going to make sure wall faces is selected because I don't want it to fight me on picking the right spot. I'm going to get wall face to wall face. I'm going to get wall face to wall face. I'm going to look at the dimensions and they said 
53, 6, and 42, 8. And that's it. I feel like that is faster than me doing it the just draw by location line way that we did originally. Not necessarily even the rectangle before that when I drew all four lines in the correct location. But I don't know. Um, technically, you could say here if I just start and I do 53, 6, 42, 8 snap snap that was faster but now you don't have dimensions so did i have location line going just now and in, in the proper spot did i did i draw that correctly did i type in the right numbers is there a way right now to verify that i drew those right ways and if you're saying temporary dimensions if i click on that the temporary dimensions are, of course, by default going to wall center line because, you know, that's the most helpful location for us. That's sarcasm. It's bad. It's not good. So we can't verify that. We could take these temporary dimensions and we could bring them on the inside of the walls. And then we can use that to verify, okay, 53 foot six. But again, why wouldn't you have just placed a dimension? So again, lots of different ways. The purpose of this stream is because I'm showing what I do. And I feel like that's the fastest way to get that. But um, actually, I'm wanting to leave that. I'm going to want to pull up the one that has the dimension string. So I'm just control Z back. So. Um, I'm not going to go too much further because I do want to have a little bit more direction on this. Uh, so I'm not skipping too much of the basics. So I think the last thing that I can go over is the last two things I'll go over is the project browser and then the client information uh, filling out. So um, under the project browser, you're going to see all the different views we have for our floor plans that we're going to be doing here. And again, considering that this stream is not a universal fix all, this is how you're going to need to do your things. Um, I am telling you how I've traditionally done my things and a lot of common ground that I've had with clients. Um, also to be clear, I will never release standards and practices of how I'm going to be, of how I do things with other clients. So although I'm going to try and provide as universal of answers as I can, not only as a teacher, but I will try and talk about standards as a professional that I have gone, that I've often encountered enough to where it would not be taken as a uh, trade secret with people. But um, I'm just going to say, just looking at the project browser here, um, the levels, of course, need to stay basement, first floor, foundation. These, whether or not they're going to be an actual level that needs to be a view that's placed on a sheet, they should exist because you're going to very likely reference them one way or another. Your foundation may not, or more specifically, your like bottom of footing isn't necessarily going to be a level that you're going to be opening and looking at and putting on sheets and such, unless you're an engineer. Uh, but it's good to have as a level because you're going to use it to reference to other things, even as a view sometimes, even because you can have items in an elevation just be a reference plane without them being a view as well, which we'll go over in the future for half walls and such. But even considering that, there's a couple of views in here typically by default that you're not going to need. And it can be a little intimidating, especially at first getting back into Revit, having to navigate the project browsers and such, seeing all these views clutter things up. So when I was first using uh, resident, when using the Revit templates that came before making my own, uh, another first thing that I ended up doing in here is coming in here and definitely deleting the framing plans because I do not do framing plans in Revit, nor have I encountered anyone where I've had to collaborate on them caring about framing plans in Revit. 
Um, even if you want to know framing construction for new and demo construction and such in Revit, I still do those things and have still never needed to do a framing plan. So I get rid of those. And then the electrical plans, one of my things that I'm going to cover is I have found it easier to create ceiling plans, aka reflected ceiling plans, aka electrical ceiling plans as a ceiling plan. So electrical plans on a designer standpoint can be it can be considered a floor plan because there's times where people need to know where the outlets and switches and such are and in more kitchen and bath sense. But most of the time where I've had to express, actually, I will say all the time that I've ever had to express in a client where electrical systems are, I've always had to do it in the ceiling plan because it just made more sense to have the lights and the electrical systems and then an underlay, which we'll go over, of the floor plan all just kind of be in the ceiling plan system. So I'm also going to delete these electrical plans. Oh, I missed a framing plan. And I guess I'll leave the site plan in just in case that comes later, but that's going to be often something I'm going to remove too. As a designer, I'm not often doing site plans. And if I'm collaborating with site plans, it's usually in AutoCAD or some third party software where I'm not necessarily always making the view in Revit. But I am not saying that it never happens because it definitely does happen. So we can already see right now, just looking at our floor plans and ceiling plans, we have significantly brought down the amount of things that we have to filter through. Um, also, if your project doesn't have a basement or it doesn't have a second floor, you're going to see even more of these are going to disappear and then you're going to have an easier time filtering through here. Now, the last thing I'm going to go over is inputting your client information because that is, again, another one of the very, not just first day, but like first hour in the new Revit project file, things that you're going to be wanting to do. So some of these, some of those items are going to be available in the sheets. We're eventually going to go over sheets and you're going to see that a lot of that project information can be accessed through the sheet and be updated in the sheet. So if we knew that our owner is uh, Mr. Smith um, and that's all we put in here for now, we're going to see that in other sheets. Obviously, Regardless of whether we're not whether we're looking at the first floor plan or an exterior elevation plan, this project is Mr. Smith's project. So Revit is smart enough to know that a project, a client, is going to be consistent across its sheets. But what I'm talking about is under the Manage tab, there's Project Information and uh, a couple other project information, project parameter type things that we'll go over that is relevant to the Revit project. But again, under Project Information, we're going to get the different things that are going to populate throughout different parts of Revit. Um, this can work under some of the analytics when you're working Revit against the location and geographical surfaces, uh, services. But uh, a majority of this information, like you'll see here, is going to be the information that's going to be populated to your sheets. So not all of this information will appear in all of your sheets but again if you're working on a real project that you're going to be working on for a while even in school if you're going to be working on this project for over a month or so it's really worth it to just pop over here maybe right after setting your level lines or maybe even right after saving the file you just come here fill out as much of this information as you can and of course if you're a student you get that fun part of just making a fictitious client so just get it out of the way throw it in here and then later on um, you're going to have a lot less work with filling out some of the sheet information uh, one thing you will notice is this is project information and some of the informations on the sheets are relevant to that actual sheet so there will still be some things, even after filling out all of this, there will still be some sheet specific items that you're going to have to fill out. Uh, the only little hang up that I noticed from people in here is all of these informations you can type when you click in the project issue date. You can just type in a date, 
10, 01, 22. For project status, we're going to call this schematic design. It's probably not even that. Client name we've already got in. Project name is going to be uh, Let's Play 1. And then project number is going to be 00001. But project address, if you click on it, you'll notice it doesn't let you type anything. And that's because this is this has its own separate dialogue. So in here, you have to click these ellipses, and then it's going to come up with an address. So one, two, three, four, let's play Drive, Colorado. Co wait, let's do, I live in Colorado, Colorado. Nope, I did that backwards. Beautiful. And then once I've put in enough of this information, you're going to see that it will populate over here. And also by default, with the default time or the sheets that come with Revit, they have a timestamp. Okay. Well, uh, because I don't want to pigeonhole this project down to being a too specific of a project that is not meeting the needs of everybody. I'm going to go ahead and leave this here, uh, see what comments and uh, responses I get on this, uh, see if there's any suggestions, and then I'm going to be setting up my next uh, play. So I am I may eventually get in a habit of a weekly release of this, but uh, because I'm going to be having lots of plans coming up. It may end up becoming bi-weekly for now. So if you follow me on Instagram or Twitter, I will make sure to give more heads up, especially than I did today on uh, future streams. But because I knew a lot of people were going to be busy, I just wanted to get this one out for people to catch at their leisure for the recordings. And then I'm going to begin working with people to see for those that do want to see me in live stream and want to give me live feedback while I'm drawing this. And while you tell me, while you all tell me what we are creating and while you tell me what tools I need to use and um, how to explain them while I'm using them, that's what's going to be driving the next steps. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that now. Thank you all for joining. And uh, please reach out on chat or Twitter or Instagram if you have any suggestions on where you would like to see this going in the future. Thank you so much.